I'd like to welcome everyone to today's official virtual UN 2023 Water Conference event on localizing water relevant sustainable development goals. My name is Claudia Ringler and I'm with the International Food Policy Research Institute and I'm moderating today's event. Localizing and realizing the sustainable development goals will require deep transformations in every country on the globe. Contextualizing targets towards a locally relevant subset of goals is challenging due to competing interests and trade-offs, but also synergies among multiple sectors and, and actors. And given the country and region specific risks posed by future uncertainties, this complex area is currently being analyzed under a task force committee of the International Water Resources Association, which was established in 1971 as a global forum for interdisciplinary knowledge and experience exchange to supplement the activities of existing organizations and to fill interdisciplinary voids that exist in the professional field of water resources. Certainly a challenging and ongoing task. The task force is also a direct commitment to accelerate water action under the water action agenda of the UN 2023 Water Conference. We are eager in this event to hear from all of you. To participate in our Q&A session, please submit your questions on ifqri.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfqri on Twitter. Without further ado, I would like to now introduce Professor Jimmy Tsai, who is the Ben Jie Yen Professor, Wen Te Chao Faculty Scholar, and the Donald Bigger Village Faculty Scholar at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign to provide opening remarks on the task force and the goals ahead. Over to you, Professor Tsai. Thank you, Claudia. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to this event on downscaling water relevant SDGs to country basin and the local scale. So this is an ongoing task force of International Water Resources Association. Next slide, please. So our purpose is to promote, unite, and expedite, uh, expedite country local efforts around the world toward the downscaling of SDGs. So now we have this top-down SDG at the global level as guidelines, uh, but it is a time for us to build up local experience and local implementation. At this moment, we do, we do, not, we do worry about how and when the general global goals can be converted into local water management practices. Uh, but we may have a promise to our next generation. Don't, don't worry about that. So that is what DWAT says. Next slide, please. Our objectives are as following. So first, we're going to synthesize country experience. Uh, so by doing that, we're going to um, help countries and regions to share their experience. We're going to promote integrated research, education, and the practices. And, uh, and we were, by choosing some pilot basins, cities, and the countries, uh, we're going to develop some local SDG indicators. Uh, so eventually we hope to promote evidence-based decision-making for lo local water management and provide guidelines for management practices at the basin or sub-basin uh, scales. We believe these objectives can be achieved if people around the world work together. So the key measure here is to have multiple stakeholder communities in different countries, regions, areas to collaborate. Next slide, please. So we expect to have the following 
outcomes, research advances and knowledge discovery, especially uh, as guidelines at the local level, capacity building through training and education programs, um, institutional development, especially the new policy development to uh, implement SDG at local level, uh, and then enhance the best management practices, and also eventually will have will achieve the environmental sustainability through water management. We expect expect this outcomes are uh, built up from the local level and emerge as regional and the international effort, uh, impacts. So what our task force does, we will organize workshops, conference sessions, and townhouse meetings for raising awareness and to exchange uh, uh, practice, uh, experience. Uh, we will have workshops by different groups, uh, such as country-specific working groups, uh, urban working groups, urban or rural working groups, or some groups on education. Uh, so we will also uh, support some public uh, special issue in publications, uh, including uh, case studies, technology policy, and some synthesis. Uh, we will particularly emphasize stakeholder communication and uh, and uh, incorporate their voice into the final decision making processes. Uh, so multidisciplinary and cross-country region collaboration is the key for DWAT SDGs. We next slide, please. Next slide. Um, oh, sorry, we, we already go through that. Next slide. Yeah. Multidisciplinary uh, and cross-country region collaboration is the key for DWAT SDGs. We welcome researchers educators, professionals, stakeholders, and others around the world to join our task force. Uh, to become a member of SDG and Water, uh, please contact the office of IWRA or any of the uh, task force bureau members. Next slide, please. So, so now in the following, uh, you see the, uh, the contact information and the pictures of our, our bureau uh, members. And in the following, you will hear some country stories uh, from our task bureau members. Thank you. Yeah, excellent, great introduction, and then also very interesting abbreviation. <laughs> Don't worry about that. When when I think the message is we have to worry <laughs> extremely about that. So you know, that's I think already a great message. Um, and yes, good to know everyone can join this particular task force. And now we'll introduce some of the members, and they come in through short lightning talks and those lightning talks will actually start in the far east australia uh, where it's the middle of the night and we move slowly from east to west and we end in brazil so without further ado i'd like to now introduce uh, dr paul sotour he's a research fellow um, and lecturer at Monash University in Australia, and he's at the a Sustainable Development Institute there. And so, of course, sustainability must be core to SDG six on water and associated goals. Over to you, Paul. We look forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. Um, hi, everyone. G'day, and Woman Jekka from uh, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung lands here in Melbourne. Victoria. It is the middle of the night, so you'll have to bear with me um, a little bit. Um, if we we'll jump into it, though, please move into the, the next slide. Um, so to begin with, uh, how is Australia progressing against the SDGs? Well, I probably can't go into this in detail now, but if you are interested, you can head uh, to sdgdata.gov.au to see Australia's national reporting. Uh, or alternatively, uh, see an independent review that we were a part of as at our research institute, um, the Transforming Australia SDG report. But to summarise, our, I guess, reporting and progress has been patchy at best here in Australia. We are ranked 35th in the world, which is actually one of the worst in the OECD. And if you jump to the next slide, please, when we look at say something like SDG 6, for example, you might be mistaken for thinking otherwise. 
Um, as you can see on screen, we have 98% coverage of equitable access to safe water and, and similarly for equitable access to sanitation. Um, but when we question critically that remaining 2%, we find that the devil is in fact in the detail. Uh, that 2% comprises some of the most vulnerable communities throughout Australia, those in remote regional areas, our Indigenous population, and, and those in urban environments that are uh, often low income, no income, and homeless. So we really are at risk of leaving people behind if we don't implement uh, more serious action and, of course, develop more appropriate indicators that can allow um, different parts of Australia, which is a big country, to, to more meaningfully um, tell its story. So if we jump to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to share with you today, um, with my remaining minutes, um, some work that we had been a part of in starting to uh, localise or downscale the SDGs to achieve this purpose of providing a more richer contextual picture. And if you jump to the next slide for me, um, within the Australian water sector, this work has really been premised on uh, three major outcomes. The first, building SDG engagement and capability throughout the water sector by demonstrating the value to the Australian water sector of engaging with the SDGs in delivering greater values to customer and multiple benefits for communities and environments. Once we have built this engagement to then work with the water sector to harness the SDGs as a lens for transformative change, providing a framework for understanding the contributions that the Australian and New Zealand water sector can make to the SDGs, both now in their current practices, but also in the future as they transition to more uh, richer sustainable development outcomes. And then finally, in doing this, uh, localising or downscaling SDG targets and indicators in ways that can support our water sector to effectively monitor the progress that they're making. Um, so jump to the next slide. How have we gone with this? Well, there's been two specific phases of work undertaken to date. The first has been a mapping and measuring exercise, working with the Water Service Association of Australia and over 30 to 40 different uh, water sector stakeholders from across Australia and New, Ze New Zealand. We have um, look to understand how do water stakeholders contribute to the SDGs? And then secondly, how can they measure this contribution? Um, so if you jump to the next slide, where that has really landed us from our analysis is importantly, the recognition that we uh, in Australia, in the water sector, contribute to all SDGs. And it is um, not enough to simply just focus on one, two or three. We need to be looking across all 17 as a holistic and integrated framework. And within those 17 SDGs, there are over 73 different targets that water sector stakeholders specifically contribute to and approximately 300 indicators. So a really long, diverse list of different ways the water sector is contributing to the goals. And we'll jump to the next slide. The next part of this challenge was really to understand, well, how do we harness this potential? And there was a prioritization and transformative process undertaken to really look at the across these different SDGs to understand the common ways SDG we're contributing and starting to think about how we can harness that. So if you jump to the next slide for me, please, um, running out of time. But what we came away with was eight key focus areas and 22 different ways that sustainable development is being achieved in the Australian water sector with a number of different relevant targets. And finally, the next slide, through this process, what we've been working on is developing localised current indicators and then what we're calling utility of the future indicators or future focus indicators that sit in along these outcomes to allow our water sector to optimise their sustainable development outcomes. Um, that's it from me and, and thanks very much. If you go to the final slide, you can um, find this report via uh, a web link, which I'm sharing in the chat thread. Okay, excellent. Um, really excellent, Paul. Quite sobering that, if I understood correctly, Australia reports on less than half of the SDG six indicators. So what is then our demands or requirements on low and middle income countries if one of the highest income country um, you know, cannot report uh, on even half of its own indicators? Yeah, with that, we move uh, directly into, uh, you know, uh, 
a lower middle income country, India, and we'll hear from uh, Dr. Riddhi Singh. She's Associate Professor at the Department of Civil Engineering at the Indian Institute for Technology in Bombay. Over to you on uh, localizing SDG 6, where to start in a country like India. Thank you. You're muted. Thank you, Claudia. So jumping into the Indian context for SDG 6, um, we all know the SDG 6 indicators, but in order to understand how this will be operationalized in India, I wanted to start by talking about the governance context of um, water related policy and operations in India. So the SDG 6 are international goals and that has been adopted by the central government at the national level. So they've mapped SDG 6 and not just 6 to, uh, but all other SDGs to different ministries. And at the national level, they're using the SDG 6 goals also to uh, think about policy related to water. Uh, but really, water is a state subject in India. So that means that the SDGs will be operationalized by the states mainly with the national level government overseeing that process. And so uh, what, what happens at the national level are that these indicators are defined and to do uh, standardization, the states are uh, requested to send the data, which is synthesized. So um, with those indicators, the hope is that there will be aligning of the objectives to the SDG 6 objectives, the currently functioning irrigation, water supply and agriculture departments. As the states do this exercise repeatedly, will probably start aligning themselves to the SDG goals. And then that will trickle down to the urban rural household uh, level uh, implementation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, uh, what is happening right now in terms of reporting. The, um, there is a public think tank, Niti Aayog, which along with the Ministry uh, of Jal Shakti, which is Water Resources and Rural Development, have come up with the Composite Water Management Index. So what they have done, instead of directly adopting the SDG 6 indicators, they've tried to look at their meanings and come up with thematic areas which are more along uh, the Indian context. So there are nine thematic areas under which several indicators under each thematic area have been identified. So you can see around 28 indicators in the latest list, and they cover a wide variety of issues related to sourcing of water, uh, participatory management on farm, uh, policy uh, and governance uh, steps that the state governments take. For example, whether the state have a separate integrated data management or not uh, for water resources. And um, really, some of these indicators are being collected at this scale for the first time. So as this exercise is carried out year by year, we're hoping to get a lot of information about what is happening and uh, what is the granularity of SDG achievement in India. Next slide, please. So with that, I wanted to share some of my thoughts in terms of where I think uh, we need to start in localizing them to the very rural village or urban levels. Um, so if we look at the indicators that are currently defined, I feel uh, that there is a need to also focus on the health of water related ecosystems more. A lot of the indicators are defined around water use, but we need to have some which uh, account for aquatic um, ecosystems, maybe uh, counting the species or something like that. So we need a little bit more along that. And uh, Claudia already mentioned in the introduction about understanding synergies and trade-offs between the different sub-goals of SDG 6. And uh, this is going to be a big thing in India too. But um, as I said, the data is just being collected. So I think when all this data comes through for around five-ish years, we'll have a lot of information to analyze and understand these trade-offs across socioeconomic and agroclimatic settings in India. In terms of where the research needs to go here is, um, you know, obviously to focus on the human water, uh, human water interactions in India. Uh, what is the relationship between biophysical drivers of water availability and their socioeconomic settings? And this is challenging because of the heterogeneity in India of both the water uh, availability resource base and also the use base. So adopting a pilot basin to operationalize these issues and looking at the cross scale issues um, would probably be a good starting point uh, for research in this area. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you. When when you said this is a subsidiarity principle and states are reporting progress, I'm wondering, you know, if states might feel pressured to report improvements over time, even if those improvements might not exist. Anyway, that's something we might have time to discuss later. Let's now move yet further west uh, from India to Egypt, and we'll uh, hear from Dalia Sabri, who is an international development practitioner with KEO, International Consultants, and she will talk to us about Egypt and uh, I think uh, West Asia and North Africa. Thank you. Over to you, Dalia. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, event. Um, I'll, uh, I'll be quick, <laughs> so I know we have the limited time. So um, uh, just to uh, start with uh, how the, the Egypt adopted the SDG uh, in 1996 uh, to face the to, uh, during the, the national uh, United National uh, National General Assembly uh, in uh, 20, uh, 2016, sorry, and uh, it recognized that uh, despite all the willingness to achieve our uh, SDGs in Egypt, we still have a lot of uh, uh, problems. Um, and in order to achieve these SDGs, uh, the government has adopted uh, a, a vision which is called uh, a vision of Egypt 20, 2030 to achieve all the SDGs. Uh, so um, this uh, in this uh, vision of Egypt uh, has been uh, prepared as a comprehensive plan to represent all programs and projects. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> So uh, the, the, this um, vision is uh, based on uh, uh, how we are supposed to implement the SDGs in Egypt. We, uh, we, we, we want to analyze where we want to be, how we are, what are the major issues and what is necessary to focus on. And we need uh, the, uh, our indicators, the localized indicators, not only the, the United Nations indicators, uh, to uh, reflect the achievement of our objectives and also to define the challenges that prevent the achievement of each objective. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, to operationalize these uh, SDGs the, and the, the strategy of the uh, 2030 vision, the, the government has uh, the, um, uh, uh, introduced participatory approach, which is um, uh, getting together all participants from different uh, sectors, like the government, private sector, civil society, and uh, academics and research centers, all, all together to uh, develop a methodology to uh, uh, achieve the SDGs goal through uh, uh, many workshops, meetings, preparations, and coordination between all of them, and also introduce, uh, also include the ministerial meetings, uh, on the governmental uh, level. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the water uh, is a very important source in Egypt because we are in a, in an arid region. We uh, we have we Egypt is considered as a scarce uh, country. So uh, the the water is uh, operationalized in uh, by the government, and um, it is considered as. Um, uh, a very important resource, as I said, as, um, it's holistic uh, in nature. So it is covered under uh, different uh, pillars. And uh, uh, the, as you see here in this uh, slide, the institutional framework for the SDGs uh, includes many of the governmental ministries. Uh, the fund is coming from the Ministry of Finance and it's, uh, the flow of finance is, uh, is shown in the figure here. And we have different uh, uh, companies and agencies that work under these ministries to implement the projects for the water and sanitation to achieve the SDG uh, goal number six, which is water for and sanitation for all. Uh, and also the, the main important thing is that we have the donors and banks which uh, provide the funds for the for these agencies to implement the, the projects. Um, and we have the, the think tanks in each of these projects, like we have the Egyptian Environmental uh, Affairs uh, Agency, which uh, is uh, uh, providing all the um, introduced the, the, the all the resources. So next slide, please. 
So the government is uh, trying to overcome all the challenges we have uh, through the coordination between different departments, identify, as I said, most of the, most of the challenges that we face, uh, building and uh, integrated database that we can use as uh, uh, to implement the, the SDGs and monitor the achievements and to raise awareness between people because this is most important thing uh, through the media, graphics and storytelling. Next slide, please. Um, this is just to, to show how, where we uh, where we are. Uh, Egypt is uh, is uh, considered as uh, on on track, um, and its uh, uh, country score is sixty eight point seven, and its um, its achievement is uh, uh, is maintaining SDGs, but still we have some challenges. Next slide, please. Uh, this one only only to show the where we are in the in the. Uh, the, the Arab countries, uh, as you see here, like uh, 10 countries are on track in the, in the Middle East. Uh, Egypt is one of them, and uh, we still uh, some remain, uh, some challenges remain in many of them, and still uh, some of them are working, but um, um, and still it's, it's not easy to achieve the SDGs in, the, uh, in number six. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Yes, I did see a lot of red in that last slide and red says challenges. And I also found it interesting to hear a more a top down uh, way of localizing SDGs compared to India's bottom up. So now we move to our last uh, lightning country presentation. They're really lightning, very fast presentations. We move to the, the, the most Western location, Brazil, that we have uh, across our presentations. And I guess my question to, to our presenter, uh, Professor Alci Chemes Celeste of the Department of Civil Engineering at the Federal University of Sergipe in Brazil is, does SDG 6 matter in a water abundant country like Brazil? You know, we've heard about all these dry places. Why would, why would we care uh, in your country? Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Good day, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Alci James uh, Celeste. I'm a associate professor at the Federal University of CGP Brazil. And today I'm going to try to very briefly try to answer to, the que the, to this question. Okay, Claudia, does this, the G6 matter in a water abundant country like Brazil? Uh, slide two, please. Uh, as we know, Brazil is home, home to some of the largest freshwater reserves in the world, including the Amazon River, which accounts for around 20% of all freshwater on Earth. However, Brazil's water resources are not evenly distributed, with some regions facing water scarcity, particularly du during droughts. For example, the, the state I live in, Sergipe, lies within a region we call the drought polygon. So this one covers an area of around 1 million square kilometers in northeastern Brazil, including nine states, and gets only about 375 to 750 millimeters of rainfall per year, which is very low. So every now and then we face uh, droughts here, although now, right now it's pouring here outside. So anyway, we know that SDG 6 aims to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all, but despite its abundant water resources, access to clean water and adequate sanitation facilities remains a big problem in Brazil. Uh, next slide, please. please. Uh, in 2014, members of the civil society created a working group to promote and monitor the implementation of Agenda 2030 in Brazil. This group produces the so-called Spotlight Report, which is an annual assessment of the progress made towards achieving the SDGs in the country, highlighting both the achievements and shortcomings in, in the process. According to the most recent 2022 report, the implementation of the SDGs in Brazil is not happening as expected. Of the 168 applicable targets for the country, 110 experienced setbacks, 11 remain stagnant or regressed, 14 are threatened, and 24 have insufficient progress. Next slide, please. Uh, over the years, the Brazilian government has implemented actions to address water management and sanitation issues, such as the National Plan for Basic Sanitation, and the national water resources policy. However, many, many challenges are still there here in Brazil. Uh, the Spotlight report indicates that access to basic sanitation services is still limited in rural areas and among vulnerable groups, such as indigenous communities. Also, climate change has a lot of impact on water resources in Brazil, including frequent floods in the, in the south and droughts in the north and northeast. Next slide, please. 
Uh, well, in summary, all SDG six targets are at risk or setback, as you can see, as you can see in this figure on slides on slide five. Uh, now, slide six, please. Uh, as an as an example, let's see the case of target six point one, which is uh, achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all by twenty thirty. This figure shows the most recent twenty twenty one data available on the Brazilian National System for Water and sanitation data, I just checked this a couple of days ago, we find that 36 million people, which is around 17%, 17% of the population, still do not have, have access to drinking water supply, and 96 million, which is around 45% of, of the population, have no access to sewage treatment. Next slide, please. So to conclude, the answer to our question is yes, SDG 6 does matter in a water abundant country like Brazil because fair and sustainable access to water and sanitation is essential for the country's development. Uh, in this context, Brazil must take still further actions to achieve SDG 6 by investing in infrastructure to improve the water and sanitation access and also by taking measures to mitigate the impact of climate change and improve disaster preparedness in vulnerable areas. Uh, I think time is, is come, right? Uh, so that, that, brings us, that brings us to the end. I appreciate your time and attention today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, excellent. I think yeah, you really put to rest the question. <laughs> if we need to monitor SDG 6 in a water abandoned country, I saw a lot of regression. I didn't actually see any progress in your slides. There must have been right. some that you omitted, <laughs> I <Right>. hope. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, before we now move to our uh, two discussions, I'd like to just uh, remind everyone that uh, we we will soon come to our question and answer session as well. And please submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, or by using the hashtag ask if pre on twitter um and before we answer your questions some have already trickled in which is great i'd like to uh, introduce our two discussants the first one is raya stefan she's a water law expert and she's also the deputy editor-in-chief of the journal of the international water resources association and the journal is called water international i hope you have seen it or otherwise please look it up our second uh, discussant who will follow uh, raya is uh, Timothy Foster, Dr. Timothy, he's a senior lecturer in water, sorry, a senior lecturer in water food security linkages, which is excellent as, you know, water for what, and he's based at the University of Manchester. So let's first hear from Raya, please, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Claudia. So after uh, hearing from uh, our presenters uh, from uh, four different countries with very different geographic, political, institutional and economic situations, I want to share with you the following thoughts and actually perhaps it's more reminders than thoughts. My first uh, reminder is that the SDGs are about partnerships and cooperation. This comes from the UNGA resolution. It is one of the first sentences in the resolution, which says, Quote, all countries and all stakeholders acting in collaborative partnership will implement this plan. So partnership and cooperation are not only between countries, but they are also between stakeholders. And we saw this appearing in the four presentations. We heard, um, and we heard also from the presentation the challenge to identify and, and, and involve all relevant stakeholders in implementing uh, SDG 6 and the related uh, goals. The second important statement in the resolution is that the SDGs seek to realize the human rights of all. To my point of view, I mean, this is key. And the resolution mentions explicitly the international commitment of the states to realize the human right to safe drinking water and sanitation. This right has been recognized as central to the realization of other human rights. So it puts water at the core of uh, reaching many goals and many rights. This approach implies not only enabling achieving SDG 6 with infrastructure and technology and investments, as was, was as appeared and as was mentioned, and of course it is essential, but also adequate financial means, because we have to know how to pay for water and sanitation services, how not to leave behind population who cannot afford paying, it raises the criteria of affordability that we have to bear in mind and the uh, uh, and related indicators. 
Uh, my uh, la a third reminder is that Agenda 2030 seeks at fully integrating the three dimensions of the principle of sustainable development, which are the economic, social, and environmental. And this means that we always face the need to reach the best possible balance among these three aspects while searching to reach the goals. But because we might have contradictions among the goals, for example, reaching sustainable energy for all, if we are going to use hydropower, what do we choose? Access to water or access to energy? How to make the balance between the two? So this leaves us with the question of how to implement these goals and uh, SDGs in particular, bearing these, the principles and the relevant scales of implementation need to be identified depending, of course, on the specific settings of each country, federal complex states like India or central states like Egypt. Um, I would like to conclude uh, with uh, uh, other reminders, final words, then other facts uh, that also appeared in the, in the presentation, and as we all know, it concerns using SDG 6 generally, is that the world is Austria. This is why the UN has launched the Global Acceleration Framework, which has identified five accelerators to optimize financing. I think we heard about this in the presentation. Improve data and information, capacity development, innovation, and governance. Under governance, the accelerator approves uh, sector and transboundary collaboration. It brings us to the collaboration between partners, clear roles. Everyone has to know what is the role, what is the responsibility, stakeholder involvement, and effective and inclusive institutions. So I, uh, I note that these uh, correspond exactly to the challenges. And I think we need to direct our thinking toward how to best address them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Raya. I think excellent uh, summary of, of the various interventions and also moving us forward in terms of what we need to do differently. So we'll now hear from uh, Dr. Foster, uh, his, you know, the way he, he brings the various talks together, I think from a data science perspective. Please over to you, Timothy. Yeah, thanks, Claudia. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think there's a number of really kind of interesting um, pathways and, uh, and and solutions that were emerging from from the various talks. I guess one of the things that I wanted to touch on in, in the few minutes that I have is that I think a key thing that kind of underpins all of those potential efforts is the need to be able to effectively monitor progress towards the SDG goals, whether that's around water availability, uses and demands, or, or the societal and environmental outcomes uh, related to water in different areas of the world. And I, I think that's an area where we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and there's uh, a lot of challenges to be solved. We saw some of the examples of that, even from uh, higher income countries such as Australia and, and Paul's talk earlier. A lot of our current monitoring and data infrastructure systems have big holes, big gaps. There are fragmentation in terms of quality and standards and related to reporting. Um, and also in terms of the level of detail and granularity that we get, both in terms of spatial patterns of uh, achievement of SDGs, but also changes over, over time. Um, and this is really a problem and it poses a lot of issues because it makes it very difficult to effectively design and target and ultimately sustain water management interventions. I mean, there are some very promising efforts going on to strengthen monitoring. Uh, two examples I wanted to kind of briefly highlight the UN's new integrated monitoring initiative for SDG 6, um, UNESCO's proposals around developing uh, new global assessments of world's water resources, which I believe are going to be uh, announced and launched as part of this conference. Um, how we've obviously still got quite a long way to go, and that's particularly the case when we think about the fact that um, a lot of our SDG 6 targets in particular and other SDG targets are set to, as goals to be met by, by 2030, which is really not a long way off um, now. So I, I think that there are a number of uh, things that we need to be doing to try and think about how we can strengthen monitoring data systems to support SDG 6 implementation, um, including uh, things like developing capacity to leverage new monitoring approaches and technologies, particularly given the wealth of information we're getting through digitization uh, of observation technologies and approaches, um, but also around creating 
awareness and demand at national and regional levels for and in, in international levels for improved data to support increased compliance and achievement of SDG 6 uh, and broader water related SDG targets. Um, and Raya mentioned this a little bit in her comments, uh, particularly the need also to think about um, finance. None of this happens magically without any resource. A lot of the reporting around SDG 6 goals at national levels is largely through voluntary commitments. Um, and particularly as we look to, to lower and lower middle income countries, we need to be also thinking of mechanisms at a, at a global and international level about how we can finance um, capacity and tools and uh, and institutions needed to strengthen monitoring of uh, SDG 6 and broader water related SDG outcomes so that we can uh, implement and target the kind of the best policies and management solutions um, to advance those goals in different areas around the world. Um, so those were the kind of the thoughts that I wanted to share drawing off the presentations. Yeah, excellent. Uh, great observations. Also interesting to hear that the UN is now launching some monitoring systems for the SDG 6, when, as you said, we're coming to a close. Uh, we have uh, uh, seven years left or six six years, let's put it like that. And uh, yeah, we're starting to, to try to do better on, on understanding um, our water resources. So let's now move into the Q&A uh, session. Please, if everyone could be on, on screen. And yeah, I'll, we got several questions and I'll start, uh, I guess, with the one that's directed to a single person and it's directed to Riddhi Singh um, from Anonymous. Uh, and the question is, considering the limited managerial capacities at the municipal and panchayat levels in India, what can be done to consistently maintain those data systems that that you um, had presented, and I think that gets also to this question: top down, bottom up. You know, it seems to be all kinds of systems are in place. Um, I guess you know, as as water experts, we generally believe bottom up is is key because you know this top down uh, top down information is remains limited despite new tools. Uh, but then, how can we do the bottom up? Um, really, over to you on that. So thank you, Claudia. Um, that's an excellent question and gets at the heart of, I mean, um, heart of the problem. So I think there has been a general shift in India on decision making with respect to water in terms of it becoming more and more uh, data based. At least that's what we are aiming for. And that is why uh, the, com the composite water management index was devised with 28 indicators and the states are being invited to at least start the reporting process. And one of those indicators is to maintain a data center. Now, um, I agree that there are a lot of challenges in terms of being uh, in terms of being able to report everywhere. But there are ways to validate this data. You can do spot validation, which was done with the CWMI. Uh, so they do have a third party agency which does a spot validation of this data through other resources. Um, I think there can be some research into crowd based approaches to validate this information. And it's it's not a, you know, completely, uh, I think, a gloomy picture because in the last decade that I have worked here, I have seen um, the water resources information system come up and enable so much more research on hydrology itself. And we have freely available data for all the Southern Indian rivers in water quality data for across the country for several hundred sites. So it's it's improving and I'm hoping that uh, as we push for more database decision-making, this gets better. Okay, that's good. We, we definitely need some successes here. And maybe part of this task force has, be, has to be to showcase the successes, because I think we are all too much aware of, of the regresses and, and the, and the losses and the damages and, and the negative developments. Excellent. Can I just quickly hear from Paul for Australia and Jameis for Brazil? How would you, um, how, you know, is a bottom up approach feasible? Like uh, as, as it's being suggested in India, already questioned by our audience. Um, first, maybe Paul, Australia, what can be done bottom up? And I like that idea of the spot checks. Um, yeah, please, Paul, over to you and then to Jameis. Yeah, th thanks, Claudia. I um, have, a, have a, a slightly um, different perspective um, from, you know, based on our experience within the Australian context. And, and it sounds it sounds like my experience is, is a little similar to, to others. Um, 
in that um, the 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 bottom up uh, process obviously um, brings great importance in terms of really tapping into uh, you know localized contexts and um, and and you know I, I think as I mentioned sort of filling out and articulating the an accurate perspective of what's happening on the ground at a local scale. However, at the same time, there are really significant challenges in providing robust data sets, I think, as Timothy and a few others have pointed out, and, um, and resourcing challenges in ensuring those sorts of uh, processes are sustainable and, and, um, and you know, can be comparable to, to other contexts. And, and it's this requirement that I think also requires us to think carefully about the role of the top-down process um, and bringing that together with the bottom up to provide a more systematized framework for how we address uh, both reporting requirements and, and localization sorts of needs. Um, I think there are really promising examples of, um, of, of planning and management frameworks like integrated water management or integrated water resource management that can effectively allow us to begin bringing down um, that sort of top down sort of leadership and advocacy uh, and resource setting and tools, along with our bottom up kind of knowledge and capability to, to provide a more strengthened sort of framework for engaging meaningfully with the SDGs. Okay, um, okay good. That's <laughs> still a, a tall order. How about Brazil? What are, what are you, what is being done locally? What could be done locally, drawing on the Indian example? Right. Uh I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, both approaches are, of course, uh, important, but the, the bottom-up approach is crucial because, you know, uh, we see things happening only when, it, when, when it's coming in our region. So I think, for example, if uh, we have uh, watershed committees in different locations in the country, and these committees are actually uh, Carrying out the approaches to to uh, improve the, uh, the 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 progress of SDG six, for example, and people and these approaches are actually being carried carried out, especially uh, by the leadership of these committees. And I think people can see that happen. And because see, we now we are talking about SDG six, but most of people don't even understand what these are, right? We scientists understand a little bit about this, but people have to actually see uh, things uh, improving for them. So if we say, okay, your water service is improving because these uh, these uh, we are we are carrying out a set of things uh, uh, developed by the UN uh, uh, SDGs, for example. We are carrying out this this and. This is why uh, the water service is improving for you. So I think I think actually the bottom up approach is very important, not just the top down. Right? Okay. I'm I'm not sure. If I... No, that's good. Yeah, no, no, very good. It's important. Uh, it's good to hear that both of you are, you know, believe all of you. I think believe that we need both. So now we have three additional questions, and the first is, I'll I'll put it to Tim Timothy. I know he. He might not have the correct answer, but he, he brought in the UN. So the question is, how is the UN facil facilitating resource poor countries uh, to monitor SDGs? Um, you know, are there financial flows? How is this happening, this cooperation uh, between the UN and these new systems and actually the people on the ground who suffer, I guess, from water scarcity? This is from Michael Kuba. His second question um, that goes to Professor Tsai is how is effective stakeholder involvement, including grassroots organizations, um, ensured or enhanced in, in this uh, IWRA task force? And then a question for Raya, because great to have a lawyer uh, on this panel, um, from Shaquille uh, in Bangladesh, um, a student at Rajshahi University. Is existing international law for water sharing um, good enough for cooperation across countries? um yeah what you know what, what are policies to implement international water sharing and who is responsible for implementation so 
Tim, how can countries access these new tools from the UN? He might not have the answer, but maybe you can. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the I think the defining the financial flows is probably above my pay grade. Um, but it's um, I I think the role that the, the uh, an agency like the UN certainly has, I mean, is partly what was kind of pointed out in some of the earlier discussions is that it, it's also through its international mandate got a big opportunity for helping to to share best practice um and to to stimulate a broader kind of global level discussion on why it's on the importance and the value that comes with having access to reliable and trustworthy and standardized monitoring approaches now obviously that's all great in practice and um in terms of building understanding of the the need for strength and monitoring but yes that uh, ultimately there, there is likely to need to be some kind of financial flows uh to countries to help with these processes because there are a lot of different indicators and it's it's a big burden on on national agencies that if we're honest are already struggling to keep track of a lot of water related changes given given the pace of change so I I can't tell you what the the financial flows are because that's unfortunately not a decision that I get to make but I think highlighting it as yeah it's an important area I think for kind of the global finance community to think about perhaps prioritizing and investing more resources in than they currently are doing yeah I, I think you know given we have this UN 2023 water conference this week I expect that there'll be a lot of calls and a lot of requests to support poor countries um, in border security and including monitoring border data, because if you don't know what what water we have, it's and, and will have in the future, it's difficult to 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 make the right investments. Yeah. So over to Professor Tsai on uh, grassroots organizations. You know, how can they uh, participate in this task force? Okay. Um... Yeah, that's a very good question. As I mentioned, we do hope uh, stakeholders to uh, join our task force um, as as members or or to develop some working groups. Um, so in the future, our, our task force uh, bureau we are going to have some uh, town hall meetings in in some international conferences. And through that, we, we hope to hear the opinion of uh, stakeholders. Um, and also, uh, thanks to the, the technology of social media. So hopefully, we could promote some discussions, some opinions uh, through social media. And, and then we could get the attention of uh, our multiple, multiple communities uh and now we have technology right we have uh new technologies to learn from the social media to to discover the message from the social media data um so so that's like that we will hopefully in later stage of this effort we we could be able to immense i mean extract something from the social media and, and other channels great just before uh, but, we go Oh, sorry. You wanted to add something. Sorry, but 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 to the end, the most important thing is that we hope to to have the attention of multiple stakeholders on this on this event, and uh, so and we particularly want them to know. And this is a collaboration uh, among different communities and also among countries and the regions. Right, exactly. This is cross cross country learning and cross exactly. maybe vulnerable group learning as well. And just Paul, before we go to Raya, you mentioned you know that in Australia very clearly the um, indigenous uh, populations you know have the lowest um, I guess water security indicators. And obviously, I think we probably don't have to discuss so much. I assume it's the same in Brazil and in India and and, um, and yeah, in all of our, all of the countries we work in. Paul, something on bringing in maybe in, in the Australian case, um, some indigenous communities, grassroots uh, groups. Do you see a way forward for the task force, very specifically for Australia, before we move to Raya? Um, it, it, it's a really good question and, and one that, uh, you know, a national task force that I've been a part of 
over the past few years has been really grappling with. Um, complex in that the Australian landscape is a very vast and very diverse one with a number of different uh, Indigenous communities. So um, there's a challenge there in um, how do you provide a voice for, for a number of different communities with from a number of different regions. Um, I think this question really comes back to um, how we are enabling, um, you know, those local context contextual voices uh, through a, a sort of common systematic framework and then aggregating data up to be able to effectively tell those stories. And I know the UN call for the need for aggregating data sources to provide more um, relevant sort of reporting outcomes. This is a really significant problem still. And um, finding the right indicators and the right metrics to do that is something that um, we've been working on quite a bit over the past few years and, and still arguably haven't really reached a, a good solution just yet. Okay, okay, good to know. Good to, again, efforts are ongoing. Raya, on the transboundary water sharing, the uh, student yes, is asking yes. why nothing is happening, I got it. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Actually, at the international level, so we have two, co two conventions, two framework conventions who um, are who give principles to the states to for the sharing uh, their water. One is more focused on surface water. One covers both surface and groundwater. And in addition, we have uh, uh, guiding principles which are included in uh, UNGA resolution regarding transboundary aquifers. Now the conventions are um, uh, applied to the states who have ratified them, but they include customary uh, customary rules who, who apply to all states, even those who are not party to the uh, conventions. Now the conventions are framework conventions, so they, they give guidance, and I would say their core principles are rather flexible to adapt to the different situations with factors that can be um, have to be negotiated with, between the concerned states, depending on the proper um, proper situation again. Uh, the uh, UNECE, UN Economic Commission for Europe is serving one of these global uh, convention and is uh, serving as the uh, with UN together with UNESCO as the UN agency responsible for uh, target the target on cooperation 6.5.2. So there, through the uh, UN Water Convention, there is guiding the guidance for the states to uh, towards identifying shared waters and trying to find, let's say, a means for cooperation, etc. There are reports are available. Um, on the uh, complex uh, question of who is uh, responsible to implement international water law, which is a little bit beyond the topic of this um, task force. Just I would say it's the states themselves because states are considered as sovereign, so they are responsible uh, of applying them themselves. Now there are there are means of uh, solving conflicts judicially, etc. International Court of Justice not want to enter into this debate, but usually I would say that states are more or less uh, aware of the uh, rules and that they are. Um, they don't really, this, I don't want to say that they really apply them, but sometimes they don't really discuss them. It's the interpretation that is complex, etc. And uh, I, I mean, I will stop here because otherwise I can I can talk for you. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to do another event, I think, on that topic. Yes. Yeah. So last quick question um, for Dahlia, and then we unfortunately have to close down. And uh, there's a, a comment from Ramesh Desh this Pandey from IHE International in the United States. And he just, I think, one, wants to know, you know, there's so many um, topics inside SDG 6, water use efficiency for agriculture, urban water uses, etc. Um, he says, any comments on that? And I guess, you know, maybe the comment, you know, for Egypt, do you prioritize um, one of these SDG 6 water uses? We heard about sanitation, drinking water, there's agriculture, you know, yeah, how, maybe how can we achieve them jointly? Are there priorities that, for example, you know, the most driest area we have here on the call uh, would prioritize over all others? Thank you. Well, as, as I mentioned that we have uh, this uh, participatory approach, so uh, we, uh, the government is always uh, 
have a think tank from uh, from the farmers, from the civil society, and uh, we they gather together to uh, to say which uh, what are the problems they are facing. So, uh, you know, uh, Egypt population is uh, over 100 million. So, for in order for the country to uh, supply food security for this um, a big population. Uh, they want to secure the water availability. So the water uh, uh, water resources for irrigation is very important because it consumes like 86% of the country's uh, uh, water budget. And uh, of course, sanitation uh, facilities is very important. We have many initiatives which deals with uh, sanitation um, and uh, infrastructure projects to provide uh, uh, sanitation for uh, the cities and uh, for uh, rural areas as well. And also uh, the, the main, I mean, the main, the main um, part for, for the government is that the main important uh, uh, goal is to provide and sustain the water availability for the, for the population, uh, for irrigation, for uh, sanitation, for, for everything. So um, uh, I think we, were, we work on, on, on different uh, bases. So uh, we don't have a certain, uh, a point that we portray, uh, we, we work on all SDGs as a, as a whole. Okay, okay. I mean, they are supposed to be indivisible, right? And they're supposed to be achieved together. Uh, but obviously, in countries like um, Egypt, uh, North Africa, this is, is a major challenge. So I think with that, our event is coming to a close. I, I think you hopefully enjoyed as much as I did uh, this very diverse, um, very diverse lightning speeches and entry points on how to try to really do better on, on uh, achieving SDG 6 on water and sanitation, also the human right uh, to water and sanitation. And again, this is the uh, commitment from, from, from the IWA task force as part of the water action plan of the UN uh, Water 2023 conference to you know move further um, along these lines. And again, you know, please join us and join the task force. The obviously the video will be posted online. Uh, we can also share the slides with anyone who's interested. And please feel free to contact any one of us. Thanks again to everyone for participating, and thanks to our audience. Goodbye. Thank you.